All right, good evening and welcome to the first event of the Democracy Summit. We are honored to be joined tonight by Masi Alinejad, who Jess Chirboga, the president of the DPU, will introduce uh, in a short while. My name is Dylan Griffith, I'm the vice president of the DPU, and on behalf of the DPU, we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Dickey Center for International Understanding for co-sponsoring today's programming and for joining us and the Rockefeller Center in co-organizing the Democracy Summit. Tonight's event is also a continuation of the Dickey Center's Descent and Democracy series, which we are excited to coincide with. One important housekeeping note, at the conclusion of tonight's program, we ask that everyone please stay seated until our guest has left the auditorium. We thank you for your cooperation. The Dartmouth Political Union is the preeminent nonpartisan student-led organization at Dartmouth College. We at the DPU aim to promote open political discourse through fostering understanding and seeking nuance by inviting speakers from across the political spectrum and around the world. As I mentioned, tonight's event is the first in a series of events under the umbrella of the Democracy Summit that will seek to dive deeper into the issues and opportunities facing democracies from now through the end of the year. This past fall, Jess and I approached President Hanlon and the leadership from both the Rockefeller Center and the Dickey Center uh, with the, the idea of this series because of the inflection point that we find ourselves in. With increasing political polarization, issues regarding election security, and threats to democracy around the world, we feel that we are at a crossroads where we can play an outsized role in having conversations surrounding democracy. That's why the Dartmouth Political Union, the Dickey Center for International Understanding, and the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences are collaborating on the Democracy Summit to promote conversations on the endurance of democracy around the world. We want this event to be the launching point for continuing conversation and invite everyone here and watching on YouTube to attend and participate in our upcoming events, which we will announce sequentially. But for the reason that everyone is here tonight, I will hand over the microphone to Jess Chiriboga, the president of the Dartmouth Political Union, to introduce tonight's moderator and our distinguished guest. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am honored to introduce our speakers tonight. The moderator for today's event is Professor Andrew Simon. Professor Simon is a historian of media, media popular culture, and the modern Middle East. He holds a BA in Arabic, Middle East, and Islamic studies from Duke University and was a fellow at the Center for Arabic Study Abroad in Cairo during the 2011 Egyptian Revolution. He received his PhD from Cornell University and is currently serving as a senior lecturer at Dartmouth. Professor Simon is the Modern History Book Review Editor for the International Journal of Middle East Studies and his interdisciplinary research has been published in the journal and cited in the Washington Post. Professor Simon's new book, Media of the Masses, Cassette Culture in Modern Egypt from Stanford University Press, shares the extraordinary story of an ordinary object. Thank you for joining us tonight, Professor Simon. Now for our distinguished guest tonight. Masi Alinajad is an Iranian-American journalist and women's rights activist who gained worldwide attention in 2014 when she removed her hijab and posted a photo on her Facebook page standing proudly with her hair blowing in the wind. From that, My Stealthy Freedom was born, her viral social media campaign against compulsory hijab that became the biggest civil disobedience movement in the history of the Islamic Republic. Today, it has almost 11 million followers. Iranian authorities have responded violently, arresting protesters and violating their rights while in custody. Female protesters have been raped, beaten, tortured, and killed. Alina Jad herself has been targeted by the Iranian regime in two assassination and kidnapping plots. Alina Jad's activism started early. She became politically active at a young age and began her journalism career in 2001 at a local daily paper. Her activism led her to being kicked out of high school, college, parliament, and eventually her country in 2009. She now lives in exile in New York City. Alina Jad continues to oppose the compulsory hijab and to speak out in defense of her fellow activists. The New York Times describes her as the woman whose hair frightens Iran and her widely acclaimed best-selling memoir, The Wind in My Hair, shares her extraordinary story about living in exile, leaving her country, challenging tradition, and sparking change. She is one of the most prominent and vocal opposition figures challenging the Islamic Republic through her journalistic publications, public appearances, and work telling the stories of Iranian women over social media. In December, 
Just a few weeks ago, President Biden signed the Masi Alina Jad Harassment and Unlawful Targeting Act into law to impose sanctions against persons responsible for abuses against dissidents on behalf of the Iranian government. The bill was introduced by former Republican Senator Patrick Toomey and received bipartisan support in Congress. The global endurance of democracy depends on people like Masi Alina Jad, who fight for individual freedoms across political affiliations, borders, and cultures. With that being said, I want to thank Ms. Alina Jod for joining us tonight. As always, any views expressed by our speakers are not endorsed by the Dartmouth Political Union. Tonight's event will begin with a moderated Q&A, followed by an audience question and answer period. Thank you all once again, and I will turn it over to Professor Simon. Thank you. Uh, I would first like to thank Dartmouth students for asking me to serve as the moderator for this evening's event. This invitation uh, is an absolute honor, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. Thank you, Masi, for, for joining us. I'm really excited uh, for the conversation to come. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before starting anything, yes. I have to say that I see in the audience familiar face from Iran, but mostly young people, young students, honestly, it makes me emotional because I'm coming from a country, students your age getting killed just because of demanding freedom, democracy, and dignity. And it's very, very important for me, and it's an honor for me to be among young students. You are the future of the world, and I need you. And I'm so happy and excited that you are here and you pay attention to what's going on in Iran. Not leave the room until we make decision that what we can do for women of Iran and Afghanistan. They need you. And thank you so much. Uh, so one of the words that you just mentioned, freedom, woman life freedom. Let's jump right into it. This is a slogan that is so central to the protests that are presently playing out. It's something that frequently surfaces in media coverage of them. What is the, the history of this slogan? And what does it mean to you personally? Oh, to me, everything, everything. To be honest, uh, just repeat the word and you tell me how you feel. Woman, life, freedom. It's a crime. It's a crime. Being a free woman in Iran means you're a criminal. Having a normal life is a crime in Iran. Freedom, it's too luxury for Iranians. So that's why that this slogan touched my heart and the hearts of millions of Iranian people. Look, when I say that being a free woman means you're a criminal, people might don't like people might think that I'm exaggerating, but that's why I want to actually give you an example and then you understand why I feel really good when I repeat woman life freedom. Um, from the age of seven, if you are a girl and you don't cover your hair, you won't be able to go to school. Thank you so much for joining us. So you tell me that. If the, the government, if the law telling you that you have to cover your hair to go to school, if not, they kick you out from school, how do you feel? Miserable. So this is the reality in Iran. In my beloved country, women are not allowed to ride a bicycle. Women are not allowed to, to dance, to sing, to be a judge. Believe me, we have so many powerful women. They can run the country better than these backward mullahs. Yeah, but so that's why I say that being a free woman is a crime. I'm, I'm a master criminal because I have too much hair, too much voice, and I'm too much of a woman. So that's why for women, for men, Repeating this, this slogan means that we just want to have a normal life. We want to get rid of a gender apartheid regime. One of the places that this slogan has been circulating a lot is on social media. And so I'm interested in the, the relationship between media and the present social day protests. Media. Like if we go back to protests in a different context, 1979, we have someone like Khomeini, his voice traveling on audio cassette tapes. Yeah. Moving ahead to 2009, we have one of the first instances globally of smartphone citizen journalism playing a pivotal part in mass demonstrations when it comes to Iran's green movement. Yeah. 
How is media featuring now in the present, especially social media, and is this media terrain very different than that earlier 2009 totally, moment? Totally, totally. It's a very, very good question because, um, again, again, using social media is a crime in Iran. Khamenei, the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic, banned 80 million people from using social media, but he himself being welcomed by tech companies to have account. The president of Iran, which we don't call him president, is the butcher, um, recently, just two weeks ago, got a um, verified account on Twitter. So yeah, you're right. Social media became like a weapon for the protesters in Iran. And to get back to your question, the moment that Mahsa Amini, 20-year-old girl, got killed in the hand of morality police, like millions of other people, my heart was broken. I was just watching the news through social media. But immediately, Mahsa was a Kurdish girl, Jina. People in Kurdistan took to the street to mourn for her murder. But instead of mourning, what they did they actually chanted the, 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 the well-known slogan, woman, life, freedom, in Kurdistan. And women, they took off their headscarf, and they were waving the headscarf like this. And to me and millions of people, it was very emotional to see that men were chanting against compulsory job and waving the headscarf in public and saying that no longer we're going to mourn for Mahsa. They turned the funeral to a massive protest against the Islamic Republic. Then they said, death to dictator. But we don't see that on, on, on mainstream media, social media. One of the videos that I published on my own Twitter account from Kurdistan, from the city that Mahsa was born, got 7 million views. Believe me, the mullahs, Khamenei, he doesn't get that much views. <laughs> that shows you, that shows you the power of ordinary people, the power of social media, and I always say that, Journalism, uh, mainstream media is totally dead in Iran. So that became a weapon for Iranian people um, to break the censorship, but not only that, to find each other, to identify each other, to get together and to mobilize massive rally across Iran. Khomeini's tactic, you know, to be honest, was actually um, very welcomed by a lot of radical uh, people inside Iran, but now you see teenagers, like really 14-year-old, 16-year-old teenagers, they're using their social media like, 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 their own, like their own media. They became their own leader. So women posting videos of themselves unveiled, which is a punishable crime, immediately goes viral and encourage other women, and then they take back to the streets when they stay through social media, they see that they are not alone. That's why the Iranian regime is really, really scared of social media. And that's why the people of Iran are angry with the tech companies, that while we are banned from using social media, why don't you kick out the leaders of the Islamic Republic? One of the places that a lot of these videos are circulating is your Twitter account, which provides a very lively window onto what is presently happening in Iran. I'm wondering if you could Take us behind the scenes a bit when it comes to that account. What are some of the challenges you've encountered in managing it? What do you see its objectives being? How do you collect content, verify it? What's the decision-making process behind what you tweet and retweet? Sure. I mean, I have to actually correct you. Twitter is, I have only, I think, half a million followers. But on, uh, I think you had 678,000 yeah. more than I do. I love I'm it. I'm trying to cross that 2,000 follower threshold. So it is a significant number. Please still. remind me, I have to retweet him. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have, uh, my, my main weapon is Instagram mm -hmm. because it's very, very popular in Iran. And, and this revolution is, it's, it's, it's visual. It's about, it's mm. about women like gaining their visibility back. You know, so that's why social media, uh, it's important, but Instagram is something else. Because people using their Instagram to send videos, to upload videos, and uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, to actually challenge the Islamic Republic. Twitter, mostly I, I use it to, gain the, to get the attention of uh, mainstream media, 
Biden administration, if you hear me, and um, <laughs> the government, policymakers, analysts. This is, this is my goal on Twitter. But uh, let me just, just give you an example that why I say Instagram is very important. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, I'm wearing white. Today is Wednesday, and as you, and you are wearing white as well. Um, I launched a campaign. Four, eight years ago, my Salty Freedom campaign was against compulsory hijab. Then I uh, shift the online movement to offline movement. I picked a color, white, which is color of peace. I picked a day, Wednesday, and I asked women and men to wear white if they believe in hijab. If they don't, just wear white headscarf or wearing white symbol to take to the streets. And this is how the people can identify each other, how people can find each other in public by wearing white or holding white symbol. And that's how people got together and practicing their civil disobedience. But then, instead of, like, they were sending videos to me, and only in one day, I received 90 videos from people inside Iran, like, walking unveiled, practicing their civil disobedience. And I was like, wow, I, I, when you turn on the TV, all you see is just women in hijab, women in black. But this is the reality. People were walking unveiled every Wednesday. So that campaign went viral. So Iranian regime started to filter Instagram, but that doesn't work because the Iranian people, the young generation, they're really smart. They know how to bypass filtering. So what the Iranian regime did, they started to make a new law. The head of the Revolutionary Court went on TV, and they warned the people of Iran that if anyone sent videos to Masi Alinejad, we'll be charged up to 10 years prison. Can you believe that? And that's why I found, wow. So they are scared of Instagram because it's visual. Because you can see that even women and men can upload their own videos on story and encouraging other people. So now my social media, yes, using my social media is, is, a, is a crime. I mean, people can send videos to me. I publish that. But I have to say that now it's beyond that. It's beyond compulsory job. Social media became a tool especially Instagram, for people inside Iran to be their own leaders. For mothers, for mothers whose children got killed, like Nikosha Karami was only 16 years old. The Iranian regime killed her for leading a protest. What happened, now her mother on Instagram became like, like a leader, giving like, you know, statement and challenging the whole regime. And it's, she's not alone. The Iranian regime killed 500 people, all their parents, are on social media, and I beg you to go and find them and follow them. And just, if you want to get through, through information from Iranian people, follow the mothers of those brave uh, heroes who got killed in this uprising. In addition to the, um, the filtering that you were talking about on Instagram with the Iranian regime, I think something when it comes to social media is that because it's just a tool, it could also be weaponized oh, yeah. by ruling regimes. And so in the case of the Arab Spring, especially, we saw a lot of romanticization surrounding social media oh, yes. being this inherently empowering thing in terms of mobilizing the masses. And at the same time, we have repressive regimes that are using the very same tools to crack down upon protesters and to identify them. How is, what shape is that taking in Iran? And are some efforts more successful than others in terms of what the regime is doing? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a fact. Dictators, I don't want to use the, the word, the adjective good or smart, because my friend Gary Kasparov, when I was telling him that, you know, Putin and Khamenei, they're really smart. They know how to use social media to, you know, attack us. And he was like, wait a minute, don't use the word smart for Putin, <laughs> for Khamenei. And he's right. So, but the, the dictators like Putin, Khamenei, Maduro, China, they know how to use social media to normalize a regime as well, you know. For recently, let me just, just give you an example. Recently, uh, the Iranian regime actually um, used social media to publish videos of women, colorful, inviting some tourists from the Western countries and uploading their videos on social media and saying that, look, people like Masi Alinejad, they're lying to you. Look. Women are unveiled, walking in the streets. They're not getting arrested. They're not getting like, you know, harassed in public. And I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, because 
you are now using social media to mislead the rest of the world. And I was like bombarded by media. Like, yeah, is that true? Because they're saying that the Iranian regime now no longer arrest women, unveiled women, and they are, they abolished morality police. That became, if you remember some of you, that became a headline on CNN, ABC, New York Times. And I was like, wow, so what can we do? Again, we had, like, we had to put a lot of efforts to fight back these misinformation. As you mentioned many times, I myself actually being the victim of misinformation. That was a page called Islamic Republic on uh, Facebook. So I, one day I just woke up and I saw that I was being raped. That was the news on Facebook. Masi Alinejad was raped. I was like, wow. So I just mm, reported that to Facebook that delete that. So I got back from them, uh, that doesn't violence our, our you know, policy. So they didn't remove it, but immediately that news got to mainstream media in Iran. My family were watching the main news channel in Iran saying that according to social media, Masi Alinejad got raped by three men. They were not even involved to make my teenager son involved in my fake rape scene and saying that, in front of her son, three men raped her because she unveiled herself. So this kind of you know, misinformation, disinformation, and I'm not alone on that, like a lot of time we get like uh, bullied, harassed mm -hmm. by like many cyber army trying to say that you know, Massey or many other activists, many other leaders outside and inside Iran, they are betraying their own country or they are trying to promote sanction, it hurts people. So many wrong narrative on social media which we have, you know, we have to fight them back. I mean, in terms of, just to stay with it for a minute, this idea of misinformation, one of my kind of enduring memories of being in Egypt in the days leading up to Hosni Mubarak's downfall during the Arab Spring, is going out to protests mm -hmm. in places like Tahrir Square, which becomes the epicenter of that revolution, witnessing with my own eyes what's taking place, going home at night, yeah. turning on the television, seeing what the government was reporting, yes. and it was fundamentally different. So in the case of Iran right now, how is the regime framing these protests? Are there depictions of them changing over time in, in response to certain things? And is the messaging resonating with anyone? In yeah. Iran or outside of Iran? I mean, more, I mean, it's, 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 it's beyond that. The Iranian regime actually using the mainstream media to force the protesters and their family members to denounce them. You know, um, it's so sad when you're watching TV and then you see that your heroes, like those who took to the streets, were leading the protest denouncing themselves. One of the brave women, uh, Sepide Rashno, she was the one actually challenging the morality police in the street and saying that I'm not gonna cover myself, I'm gonna film you, I'm gonna send this film to the rest of the world. She became a hero. People were talking about her. The hashtag Sepide Rashno went viral and a lot of people were saying that we have to do the same. We have to you know, film the harassers, name them, shame them. And um, immediately, like maybe after Two or three days, we saw Sepide Rashno's face with a lot of uh, bruises. How many Iranians here? Yes, Sepide Rashno. You remember? So that was the moment, actually, when I saw Sepide Rashno on TV. I, I was crying because she was there. The government actually wanted to show everyone that we tortured her, and we don't, we don't care. We don't care. We want you to see. They wanted to make an, an example. And she was like saying that, denouncing me, saying that Masih Alinejad sitting miles away and um, I made a mistake, I shouldn't send my video to her. And I was like feeling guilty. But the day after, Sepida became like more popular and hero and people were shouting her name. A lot of people made video and said that now we confess. We confess in our power. We confess that we are brave women. We confess that you are scared of us. So you see, this is how the Iranian regime using TV, not only just mm -hmm. reframing the protest in different way, like saying nothing happened. Actually, the day there was massive protest in Iran, the government was saying that American citizens took to the streets because they were protesting against the increase of the price of petrol or something. This is what they're doing, but 
most, I mean, sad part, it's that they're using this, this is like propaganda tool, using to break the heroes. I mean, I myself was the victim, watching my sister on TV, denouncing me. It was 17 minutes on TV. I, I never forget the day that I was, uh, the first time after 10 years being away from my family, that was the first time I was seeing my sister in a good quality on TV. You see, I know how to see the positive side. <laughs> and my sister was disowning me. My sister was saying, you know, nasty words about me. She's not my sister anymore. This is how a dictatorship can break you. But I break them now. <laughs> and millions of other women doing the same. When it comes to um, challenging stories that, that states are telling, you're a journalist outside of Twitter, Instagram, for other platforms as well. Um, what inspired you to become a journalist in the first place? Uh, I mean, I didn't have any other option. Because look, when you're being told uh, that you're not as uh, equal as your brother, you cannot, I mean, I, I was a little girl in a very, very tiny village, and um, I never had a clue about feminism, no clue about equality through educational system, or we had black and white TV in my tiny village. I was just watching the mullahs telling me what to wear, what kind of lifestyle to follow, how to think. I never had any clue. Outside world was like blurry for me. That was all I knew. So clearly, I learned everything from, uh, from my own experience. I had a little brother, and I remember he was able to jump in a beautiful river in the village. Um, I was not allowed to do that. My brother was allowed to ride a bicycle. I was not allowed to do it. He was allowed to go to a stadium, to play football, to do whatever he wanted, whatever. But I was not allowed to do all those activities just because of being a girl. And, um, but this little brother, he was the king of the village during the day. He was scared of the darkness during the night. So we didn't have inside bathroom in my village. We had outhouse in the backyard garden. And um, during the, the night, it was very scary. It was pitch black, even blacker than black. And I was really scared of the darkness. But my mom told me that if you're scared of the darkness, the darkness can swallow you all, can devour you. Because darkness is like a monster. But if you open your eyes as wide as you can, the darkness can be disappeared. So as a kid, I thought it's a fact, so I used to open my eyes <laughs> as wide as I could, going to the outhouse. My brother was scared to, to do that, to go to outhouse and to the backyard garden. I said to my brother, OK, you know what? There is a deal. During the day, you take me to the river. You teach me how to ride a bicycle. You take me to play football. But during the night, I'm going to take you to the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I made my brother to be an ally for me. And this is what all we, we, we have to do. So I, I, I mean, I became a rebel from early age because I didn't have any other option. I didn't want to just stay behind the curtain. So that's how I became a journalist as well, because this is another way that you can make troubles for those who tell you not to do this and do that and do this. So I became a journalist actually to help other women like myself to be a rebel. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was singing. Before everyone arrived, you <laughs> tested your microphone by singing. <laughs> I tested my mic by just saying, test one, two, one, this two. This is my job to expose people, not you. I'm a journalist. So <laughs> when it comes to, I mean, just this past week, uh, a couple in Iran was jailed for dancing in the streets of Tehran. Yeah. Earlier this week, we have the anthem of the protests. Boroye win a Grammy yes. for a song for social change. What is the relationship between singing, dancing, poetry, all these forms of cultural expression when it comes to these protests? I mean, honestly, when he asked me this question, it makes me angry. This is 21st century. We're sitting here, and we're asking that why people cannot sing, why people cannot dance. Does it make you angry? I mean, I cannot believe that in 21st century, women are in prison just because of dancing. And I still have to work 
to convince the Western government that, hey, these are not normal regime. Kick them out from Twitter. Kick them out from everywhere. And they actually forced Sherwin for the song of Baraye to do, like, I cannot believe that false confession on Twitter saying that, you know, bad mousing America for receiving this award. But right when he was receiving the, the award, people filmed him. He was so excited. He was so happy. So this is actually um, in the nature of the Islamic Republic. You know, they hate everything about being happy. Right after the revolution, what they did, they wrote their own ideology on our body. We had to carry their ideology, the most visible symbol of the Islamic Republic, with us. But people think that when we fight against compulsory hijab, it's just we fight against a small piece of cloth. No. We fight against one of the main important pillars of a religious dictatorship who tells women not to sing, not, not to dance, not to uh, shake hand with men. I mean, let me shake your hand. How do you feel? Fine. No, my government say that you, <laughs> my government say that you cannot control yourself. Honestly. I mean, nothing happened to you? I'm OK. This is the, I mean, we're laughing, but this is, this is beyond sad. This is beyond sad that these, I'm not going to use the F word, these backward mullahs are being welcomed at the United Nations. And I'm just meeting with President Macron, and I say that I'm angry that you shook the hand of Ibrahim Raisi, and he's sitting there and said, no, France is all about diplomacy. And I said, wait a minute, France is also about revolution. Let's us launch our own revolution and kick out all these backward mullahs, right? Yeah. We have to get together. Guys, I mean, I love you, but I have to talk to the young teenagers. I need you. If it's really silly, stupid, backward, then we have to do something. Girls and women your age, they're being kicked out from a school in Afghanistan. They want to be happy the way that you are. You look beautiful. You look phenomenal when you sit together. My sister with hijab, I mean, it makes me cry when I see that you can sit here, shoulder to shoulder with me. This is my dream. My mom wears hijab. And I cannot get the attention of the Western countries because a lot of people said that, shh, you're causing Islamophobia when you condemn compulsory hijab. Those who lashes us, causing Islamophobia. Those who execute us, causing Islamophobia. So young people, students, don't be scared of being labeled of Islamophobic. Believe me, supporting your sisters in Iran, in Afghanistan, doesn't make you Islamophobic. We have to be loud, loud against Taliban, against Islamic Republic, against ISIS. And believe me. Condemning compulsory hijab doesn't mean that you're misrespecting the culture of a nation. Opposite, female politicians who go to my beautiful country, a lot of them, Catherine Ashton, Federico Mogherini, they wore hijab and they were bowing to the regime and I was telling them that, why did you do that? And they said, we just respect your culture. I said, you're insulting a nation by calling a barbaric law part of our culture. And they were saying, no, actually this is the law of the land. And I said, no, this is the law of this backward mullahs, bunch of men writing that. This is not the law of the land. Slavery used to be legal. So I want female politicians and the government, Western government, to be as brave as women of Iran and Afghanistan, and you can help me. Write to them and call on them and tell them that, I mean, I don't know what you can do, but you can say that one day we are not going to school to remember the women of Afghanistan who are not going to school or not allowed to go to school. Launch that. One day take to the streets and say that we're going to go to the streets because the women's march in Iran is bloody. Teenagers your age getting killed. And if we see teenagers going to the streets here in America, maybe the policymakers do something. The time has come to have an international women's march for women of Iran and Afghanistan. And sorry for being angry. I, I'm sure that you understand my anger. Thank you so much. So you mentioned the US in the context of Twitter, but also other things. What do you think is the, the biggest 
misconception in the U.S. when it comes to what is taking place in Iran right now? Good question. Let me get back to you, get back you, you to 2009. Then you understand President Obama, when he was in power, there was massive protest in Iran. Green movement, if you remember. Uh, Obama's name was everywhere. People were chanting his name to, to, get a, to get support. But Obama was hesitating to support green movement because the US government are lost when it comes to the Middle East. They were saying that if we support the massive uprising in Iran, we might put the protesters in trouble. We must, we must actually encourage the government to put more pressure on them. You know what happened? The leaders of the green movement are still in, in, in prison under house arrest. So whether the US government support the protesters in the Middle East or not, the Iranian regime will put the blame on America. You're always guilty. But it's good to, good, to, to uh, do the right thing. So the, uh, President Biden, after, I mean, after 13 years, uh, President Obama actually went public and admitted that it was a huge mistake. So thanks to him, President Biden actually uh, changed the tone. I mean, we, we see that the administration changing the, the tone. But part of the administration is still want to have a, a nuclear deal with the, with the murderers. I mean, at the same time, they're sanctioning the clerics. But on the other hand, and they want to negotiate with the, the one that they already sanctioned. So President Biden actually and his administration took the lead to kick out uh, the Islamic Republic from women's top body at the United Nations. This is the good thing that they did. And I hope now they can actually call their own allies, the European countries, to put the Revolutionary Guards in the terrorist list. Because the US government did it already but it's not going to help Iranians while uh, you know, the US allies are not doing the same thing. So sometimes they hesitate to support Iranians because as I said, that they don't want to put pressure on them. But sometimes I think they, they believe that this is something internal and it should be dealt with Iranians inside. But to be honest, if the US government and the EU don't take a strong action, they have to face uh, all those terrorists on U.S. soil. I'm not going to be the only victim, believe me. When it comes to uh, what happened with Masa Amini and Nara Sultan, going back to the Green Movement yeah. in 2009, do you see these things being connected or do you see them as separate incidents? Is it part of a longer trajectory? Or it are is. they fundamentally different contexts? I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that they are fundamentally different. Because as you see from the beginning of this uprising, when people were in the street, uh, the first day they were chanting death to dictator. So in 2009, you mentioned about Neda Agha Sultan. Uh, people, it, the, the massive protest was about the election, but at the end of the day, people were chanting against dictator. So in 2019, again, massive protests across Iran, more than 100 cities, people took to the streets, uh, the same slogan. So clearly, um, this time, yes, it's a woman revolution, one of the most progressive revolution led by women, supported by men, but it's not about just compulsory job. It's not just about women. Workers joined us, teachers, university professors, those who don't, I mean, LGBT community joined us. Muslim people, like in Zahedan, you see that women wearing hijab, long black chador, chanting that with and without hijab, let's go for a revolution. So. It's not different, but this time, the only thing which makes it different is that we see a sense of unity among uh, Kurds, Turk, Baluch. We, we see sense of unity among oppositions inside and outside Iran. We see sense of unity even among Iranians and non-Iranians. We see that this is the first time in the history well-known athletes quitting their job, well-known actress quitting their job, removing their hijab and say that, no longer we want to be part of the propaganda tool of the Islamic Republic. That makes it different. And what makes it more powerful, the more Iranian regime killed, the more people get determined to bring this regime down. In terms of uh, this idea of unity, I think the, the Iranian diaspora is very outspoken when it comes to what's happening. But there are also 
fault lines within the diaspora itself. So you have Iranians who believe, for instance, that economic sanctions mm -hmm. imposed by a power like the US actually do more damage to ordinary Iranians rather than toppling a regime. What, what do you make of the divisions within that diaspora as well? I mean, is this something that you see or that you think about? How many Iranians are here? OK. OK. I'm, I'm going to leave to them to see whether they are divided. Do you believe that sanction is hurting Iranians? How many of you believe that when we were suffering from sanction, like after the nuclear deal, the Iranian regime sent the money to Syria, to Iraq, to Hezbollah, to Hamas, to Bashar Assad. How many of you believe that when you send money to Islamic Republic, they send it in the region to kill people, to Revolutionary Guards? Hands up. Yeah. So there is no divided. Thank you for unity. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was the one, but I'm going to admit that. I was the one. I was the one actually believed that a uh, nuclear deal will help my people, because I'm coming from poor family. I'm coming from working class. And I didn't want my people to be isolated. I didn't, sanction, I didn't want sanction to hurt my, my family. But right after the nuclear deal, we saw it. We were witnessing that the money went to the region, you know? I'm going to actually give you another picture. Maybe you have no idea about it. Right after the nuclear deal, the Iranian regime, while we were suffering from sanction, increased the budget of 51 religious institutions, including morality police. Morality police are there to beat women up. So mora the Iranian regime, while we were suffering from sanction, increased the budget of revolutionary guards. Revolutionary guards are shooting people in their eyes. There are more than like 20 women that I have spoken with them, they lost their, one of their eye, like Salman Rushdie. So while we were suffering from sanction, and some of the apologists outside Iran were saying that sanction hurts Iranian people, while like if the US government sent billions of dollars to Iranian government, the money went to uh, Khamenei's son, because there is there, there are two institutions called I don't know how to even explain that to you. The son of Khamenei, the son of Khomeini, they have their own institution to, prom to promote their father's belief. So the budget of these two institutions got increased. So that's why now people of Iran have a very, very well-known slogan in the streets. They no longer put the blame on America. They say that دروغ میگن دشمن ما آمریکاست دشمن ما همین جاست. They lie to us when they say that our enemy is America. Our enemy is right here, the Islamic Republic. Now people are clear. I was the one when I was seven year old. Sorry guys, when I was seven year old um, girl, I was saying death to America <laughs> because I was told to say death to America as loud as کاخ سفید بلرزه, as loud as you can shake the White House. So now, go and ask the young teenagers. They refuse to step on the flag of America because they know that we are not suffering from sanction. We are suffering from corruption. We are suffering from religious dictatorship. We are suffering from those who execute us. We are suffering from those who send their beloved one in America, the government, all the clerics, they send their beloved one here in America to have their luxury lives. But people in Iran get killed if they say that we want to be friends with America. So that's why this is the wrong narrative being sold to the Western media by the Islamic Republic. You've done a number of interviews. I've seen several of them on YouTube. Um, I'm wondering, is there a question that isn't being asked in terms of what's happening in Iran that you believe we should be considering? So let's people ask questions. I want actually to hear from you. But I believe that the most important question that nobody asks is, how come in 21st century President Biden, President Obama, President Macron, German Chancellor, how come all these progressive uh, leaders, um, instead of writing, 
standing into, in, in the right side of the history, they decide to negotiate with those who kill children. Nobody asked me this question, and I don't have any answer, I mean, to be honest. Because that's, that's the answer that we all should find. That the, that's the question that we should find an answer for this. Because otherwise, more people get killed in Iran. There is, there is, um, there is a saying in journalism, where is my professor? You, you say the, the... If it bleeds, it leads. That's beyond sad. If it bleeds, it leads. It means that if we see that people get killed in the streets, then this is a headline. If we see that people are getting raped, this is a headline. A lot of leaders in the West waiting for people to be in the street and saying that and now people are in the street or they go back home. So if they are backing, they're, they're, they're at home, so then the revolution is over, so we're not going to do anything. Are you kidding me? 500 people got killed only in four months. 50 people are in the death row. Five of them got executed. Women got raped in prison. Men and women lost their eyes. This is a revolution. We have to actually think about different phase, and different phase of this revolution is to get the attention of the leaders of democratic countries to isolate the Islamic Republic and Taliban. And I don't have any answer that why. Why I have to steal so much energy to get the leaders of democratic countries, especially feminist, global feminist movement in the side of women of Iran and Afghanistan. Let's uh, open it up to audience q and I think we have maybe yes. two different aisles here. If you have so a question. So how we're going to run this is there's going to be a mic runner on either side. And just up to two people on either side can line up at a time. Uh, and we'll go alternating sides. So if you have a question, come to the aisle, and we'll line up two at a time on either aisle. So I see people with questions. Come to the aisle. And the, the mic runners will hold the microphones for you. Salam Masi, good to see you again. Um, Merhaba. Merhaba, hello. So uh, it's good to see you again. Um, of course, this time you spoke with the exact same eloquence and beauty that you did a few hours ago. Uh, Even kissing you is forbidden in Iran. Oh. <laughs> Come on, well, let me hug you. Oh. He's my brother from Turkey. So uh, my question is, so I'm amazed at how just by social media you've been able to mobilize a huge swath of the Iranian population um, uh, to you know, mo mobilize them against the government and to start such an amazing, um, you know, you know, multiple movements like My Stealthy Freedom, the White Wednesdays, and all of that. So do you think that one day um, you could, your influence could potentially grow so much that you could um, you know, play, a, uh, play a role in the eventual toppling of the Iranian regime? Um, or you know, eventual you know the eventual realization of actual democracy in Iran. I know it's um, it's something that is badly needed, and it's certainly something that we all want. Um, but do you think that that could be um, you know a reality in the future? I mean, the government of Iran took everything away from me, but not hope. I have the dream of seeing an Iran without those backward clerics. Uh, when I say that the Iranian government took everything from me, it means that took everything away from, from people like me, from, 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 from women, from young men, like everything, everything. I mean, we have, we have a lot of people whose children got killed, beloved one got killed, but they say that in public, in the street, that this revolution needed blood. And our beloved ones sacrificed their life. So powerful, so powerful. So that means they have hope. They have hope and we will bring this regime down. And you will see that my country will be run by women and men, amazing people that no longer we're gonna fight with America, with Israel, with you know, different countries around the world. You will see, we are ready to have an Iran without Islamic Re Republic. Are you ready? You have to get ready. Yes, I have hope. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi. Um, so you made a couple points. I want to ask if you have any data to support it. So 
First, he said that women can become judges in Iran. So to my knowledge, they're not- Can be, but they cannot have- they... But you said can't. No, no, we have okay. women judges, okay. but they cannot go to court because they are women. <coughs> Shirin Abadi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, was the first woman, Google her name. She got kicked out. No longer she could do her job because, being, because of so being- So you're saying woman. there's no women judges in Iran? No. That go to court? They cannot go to the court and okay. have- if, if you are even a woman, if you want a testimony, you have to be alongside men. Okay. Your testimony is half a, a man. So if you're a woman judge, you have to be with a man. You cannot. Okay. So I encourage everyone to go search it because I've, I've seen there are 900 women judges in Iran. Uh, the second one is that uh, you said that women can ride a bike. Do you have data for that too? Look, women got into prison just because of riding a bicycle. So they can ride. Look, listen. They can ride is different than that the government write there that women are not allowed to. Of course, if you want to be a free woman in Iran, you have to break the law every day, and we do it. And that's why women of Iran are not bowing to the Islamic Republic. Don't forget. No, I'm saying that's a law in Iran. No, 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 listen, listen. Yeah, no, it's good, actually. It's good, actually. It's good, actually. Listen, there is no law in Iran saying that women should cover themselves. But you tell me. In the Constitution, nothing. But you tell me, girls are allowed to go to school without wearing hijab? Can I ask a question? No, answer this question. Women are allowed so, to go to school? Well, I have a question. So you talked about France and Emmanuel Macron. So everyone knows that there's a ban in France that hijabi girls can go to school. And you talk to the same person that's guilty himself. Of course I talk to everyone. Yeah, so that's, what's, what's the difference? Like in Iran, women, uh, girls without hijab can go to school? And in, uh, in France, women with hijab can go to school. So what's the difference between you? The difference between me and you is that I'm brave. Go I can challenge, I'm, I'm telling you, I am brave enough to challenge any compulsion. Go and listen to my talk at European Parliament. I was the one, alongside millions of other people, condemning Burkini ban. Show me one female politician. Only one female politician who dared to be as brave as Iranian women and condemn compulsory hijab and removing their hijab. So you see, I am brave enough to condemn Muslim ban. Show me one female politician who was brave enough to condemn women ban. Because all women, everyone here, you're banned from entering Iran. You are banned from entering Iran. But why in the West? People got united to condemn Muslim ban in America. But women are banned from going to Iran, all of you, if you don't cover yourself. <coughs> you get kicked out from the airport. Isn't that called women ban? What is different between women ban and Muslim ban? So this is hypocrisy. But I am brave enough to condemn President Trump. I am brave enough to condemn President Macron. I am brave enough to condemn all politicians around the world who want to make decision over the body of myself. But those clerics and those Western female politicians who are not brave enough to challenge that, they should be criticized, not me. I'm happy. Yes, you have to be brave as well. Yeah, if, no, 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 if women are banned from riding bicycle, if women are banned from being a judge. <coughs> yeah, yeah, but no, no, you have to be brave. Go and check the law. If women are not allowed to go to school, girls are not allowed to go to school, you have to condemn that loudly. Not just saying, if because it's in France is like that, then I'm not gonna do that. It's not a good thing. If you walk, watching France as an example, then why should not watching France as an example to have gay people in Iran? This is the narrative of the Islamic Republic. Anytime when we complain about comp like people are getting killed by police, they say, in America, black people get killed by police as well. Yes, so this is bad. We condemn America, we condemn the Islamic Republic. But if you say that, then use America's good example. Women are allowed to dance together. Then why don't you follow America and France to give freedom to teenagers. That's why your argument is wrong. Because when we see France and America as an example and trying to put the blame on us, on the other hand, you have to use France and America and make 
the Islamic Republic to give more freedom to people. I mean, actually, now we don't want an Islamic Republic to give us freedom. We want them to go. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this actually isn't my question. This is my mom's question, because she's a really that. big fan of yours. Um, so she said, what do you think will happen in Iran in light of the current movement? Will these protests be effective, like this round? Or will they be crushed by the government again? What is your mother's name? Marjana. Marjana. <coughs> um, of course, the level of uh, crackdown is very intense. And um, a lot of people know that. And that's why I call them heroes. They know the risk. They know that some of the story of uh, all these young people on Instagram is very, very touching, moving, saying that, they, writing to their mother, saying that I'm not sure whether I'm going to come back home or not. But mom, laugh on behalf of me when we are free. So I believe that. Uh, the government is going to use more violence to oppress people, to suppress protests, but that's not gonna that's not gonna make people to give up their fight, and you know that. So for that, we the Iranians diaspora, we need to do what they cannot do. If they go back to the streets and see face more violence, that's not gonna help them. So that's why. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, inviting your mom, Marjana John, to go to Bruxelles very soon in front of the European Parliament. There is going to be massive protest. There is going to be like uh, Iranian opposition, uh, the, the member of the parliament trying to put pressure on the Western country, the EU, to isolate the Islamic Republic the way that they isolate Putin. So that's why uh, I believe that we know that the violence is going to be more intense but the responsibility is on our shoulder. Iranians outside to convince non-Iranians to join us and um, put pressure on Western countries. Pass my message to your mother. <laughs> See her in Brussels. <laughs> Thank you. Nah, Brussels, yeah. Oh, Brussels? Brussels. Uh, thank you, Marcel, and good to see you here. So. You named for a few times Afghanistan, and I take the opportunity to ask one question which is very close to my heart, and that is about Afghanistan, and I request the audience to pay very pay close attention. So is of now the time speaking or I'm asking my question. It has been 505 days since teenage girls in Afghanistan, they are banned from going to school under the apartheid regime of Taliban. And since, two, since August 2001, women and girls across the country, they have protested multiple times, but, they, but their protests were cracked down, they were arrested, kidnapped, raped, tortured, and even killed in Taliban prisons. And diaspora uh, population of Afghanistan also protested in, hundred, in, in tens of hundreds of countries across the globe Yet, we have seen very extremely less attention and care for, from the international community, mm -hmm. from the US, from the European Union, and from the Western world. Recently, we have had both the people of Iran and Afghanistan, we have had joint protests, even in the US, across the US. Again, unfortunately, we see that the international community has forgotten Afghanistan. I, I'm not here. Uh, drawing comparisons, but right. this is something true, and I take this opportunity to raise this question that why, when women are completely wiped out from the public, social, and political and economic uh, sphere of, of, of the country in Afghanistan, the, the same international community and the same this community that we are here, that you are chanting for freedom, for gender equality, for democracy, and for justice, we have taken almost no action, no <coughs> pragmatic action for the people of Afghanistan, especially for women. So the question is, why did the international community shows even no interest for people, especially women in Afghanistan, 
and what things have gone wrong with our struggle that we have not received any of attention as we hoped or expected. Thank Can you. I be honest with you? Yeah. I don't have any answer. That's why every single time when I talk about women of Iran, I talk about women of Afghanistan. Every single time when I go everywhere, I talk about women of Afghanistan because I really don't get it. Look, there was a massive campaign called Bring Our Girls Back. Do you remember? Michelle Obama launched that campaign. It was about the girls of uh, Nigeria. You remember, that was a successful campaign. Michelle Obama, if you hear me, <laughs> you can do that for women and girls in Afghanistan. Because you can, if I do that, my brother, no one gonna listen to me. Because I keep doing that. And uh, not only that, I'm not even putting, blaming the Western uh, feminists and government for uh, forgetting the women of Afghanistan. I'm actually fighting with those who are normalizing Taliban. How? Maybe you get shocked, but this is a fact. I mean, those, my brother, you're good at searching. Search that. Uh, <laughs> women, <laughs> female politicians, Western female politicians, wore hijab in front of Taliban in the West. Believe me, in the West there is no law forcing Western female politicians to wear hijab. Search that, you can find that. The US envoy for Afghanistan wore hijab. Oh my God, here, imagine I wear hijab here to respect Taliban. How do you feel? My brother from Afghanistan, my sister from Afghanistan, if you see me wearing hijab in front of Taliban in America, <coughs> how you feel? Insulted. Insulted? You want to respect Taliban? You're kidding me. It makes me cry. Women are getting killed in Afghanistan. Women are getting killed in Iran. But I see my powerful leaders, those who were my heroes, wearing hijab in front of Taliban. When I say, my brother, this is, this is hurting me, those women go and search for hijab and say that this is the culture of your country. I just Googled. It says that your culture. I'm wearing this because I want to respect your culture. This is an insult to a nation. When Western female politicians wore hijab in front of Taliban, in front of a Islamic Republic, but they didn't say a single word to condemn, like now, to show their solidarity with women of Iran and Afghanistan. And I want to say something that I see that beautiful solidarities from celebrities, activists around the world, and I love that. Solidarity is beautiful. I'm thankful. I'm very pleased that I see celebrities cutting their hair to show their solidarity with the women of Iran who are cutting their hair to mourn the killing of their sisters. But when I see that female politician from the West, they cut their hair, it makes me angry. Because I don't want them to cut their hair. I want them to cut their ties with the Islamic Republic. <laughs> I'm with you. Hey, um, thank you so much for coming here. It's an honor to hear you speak. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, um, the, the Iranian, you've been outspoken in your, your opposition to the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear deal. Um, the, Iran, the Iranian Republic, the Islamic Republic is close to being able to produce weapons grade uranium and from there the IAEA estimates that it could be a year before they're, they're able to come out with a nuclear weapon. The Israeli government <laughs> recently launched drone strikes in Isfahan. What should America's policy be towards the, the Iranian government's nuclear program? Do we need to be more forceful in our response to this? Oh my God, to be honest, I didn't even listen to your question. I was thinking about women of, Af are you from Afghanistan? Yeah. You are? So sorry. Oh my God, Chigo, Chigo. Sorry, my husband is there, Chigo. Okay, I'm very sorry, sorry. But I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sure you understand because um, I, I got their, um, I understand their anger and s struggle. So, yes. Um, I was pro deal, as I told you. Yeah. 
Simple answer. The Islamic Republic only understands one language, language of pressure. The way that they go for diplomacy, their diplomacy is taking hostage. Their diplomacy is killing, torturing. Right now that I'm talking to you, US citizen, a British citizen, Swedish citizen, French citizen, German citizen, Australian citizen, they are all in Iranian prison. They're being used like bargaining chip because the Islamic Republic want to get the Western country to sit down and talk about nuclear talk, nuclear deal. So in my opinion, the leaders of democratic countries must be as united as the dictators. Look, Putin, Maduro, China, Khamenei, they are helping each other. They're united. Putin is sending drones. Uh, sorry, opposite. Khamenei is sending drones to Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. So I want the Western countries address the Islamic Republic the same way that they address Putin. You cannot you know, isolate Putin, sanction Putin, kick him and his relative out from everywhere, but at the same time go and negotiate with Putin's best ally who's sending drones to, Ukraine, to, to kill Ukrainians. If you really want to have an Iran without bomb, then you better support Iranian people to have an Iran without Islamic Republic, which means the future of Iran, the Iranian like, uh, people, the secular democratic Iran, they're not going to have a bomb. This is, this is all I can say. Thank you. So, so this is going to be the last question. And then I just want to remind everyone, please stay in your seat and wait for our guests to leave before you get up. Thank you. Hello. Hi. My name is Marcel. And the translation of my name is messenger. So messenger of happiness and messenger of doing good to the people. By the way, thank you so much for coming to Dharma. It's a really good pleasure to meet you here. And really appreciate it. Um, as we all might understand that there are political incentives for some specific politicians when they talk about women's rights and general human rights. Besides the political perspective, considering the notion of freedom of choice, millions of Muslims and non-Muslims across the world, including some specific group of Hindus, Jewish people, Christians, Catholics, all of them wear a scarf as a value. I, as a girl who wears a scarf in, a unite, in the United States, a free country, I believe that it's a value and it's what God told me to do. My question is, shall we advocate for the narrative labeling of hijab as a sign of oppression? And if yes, what about the freedom of choice of millions of hijab-wearing girls like me who choose to wear a job and whose values has been discriminated through burning scarves across the world? and negatively affected in our emotions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my sister. My dream is to walk shoulder to shoulder with you in Iran, in Afghanistan, me unveiled without getting killed. I think we are all fighting for freedom of choice. And um, in America, there was a massive uh, women's march. I was part of it, chanting, my body, my choice, you remember? All I want is clear. When it comes to women of Iran and Afghanistan, when it comes to women in the Middle East, when we shout, my body, my choice, I want people in the West to understand. I want the Western female politicians, when they go to my beautiful country, when they meet Taliban, suddenly they don't change the slogan, my body, my choice, and say that, OK, here, my body can be Taliban's choice. My body can be the Islamic Republic's choice. That's all. Freedom of choice. Is value, I mean, choices are, uh, we cannot actually say that women are free across the globe if women of Iran and Afghanistan are not free to choose. That's my goal. Uh, thank you so much. I was just wondering, <coughs> is burning scarves and hijabs is respecting to other values of course. and choices? Of course, because this, this became like a chain around the neck of the girls from the age of seven. If you believe in that, you should not feel like, uh, it's like knife. Sometimes knife is killing people, but sometimes you use it to have fruit. That's different. You cannot say, oh, I'm not going to use this knife because it's being used to kill people. I burned this to show the government of Iran that I'm not your slave to force me to wear it. And my mother, 
never feel insulted. I, 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 I call on you to go on uh, my page called, uh, my hashtag called, uh, my camera is my weapon. There are so many mothers walking shoulder to shoulder with hijab with their unveiled sisters and allowing them to burn headscarf to tell the government that as far as you force us to uh, wear this, we're going to burn them all. Let's burn them all. You do that as well to show your solidarity with your sister who don't have the choice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. You just mentioned that <coughs> dancing in United States and France is a freedom. Did but I say that freedom? You told. Yeah, uh, you just go and read my article. No, now. Yeah. Okay, now I'm telling you. Yeah. I said that in the United States of America and France, yeah. we have freedom of expression. Right. Okay, but we have something wrong, like people getting uh, killed by police in America, women are being harassed in France, like everywhere. We cannot find absolute freedom everywhere, but you cannot use some wrong thing in America, in France, and say to the people of Iran and Afghanistan, shh, you know, you deserve this government because in France, you know, people are this, or in America, people are doing that. That's all I say. In Iran, we don't have freedom to be our true self. If you wear hijab here, you have freedom to wear it. And I don't have the freedom of wearing this in France. So then fight for it, and I'm shoulder to shoulder with you. Then wh why you want me to keep silent? I'm shoulder to shoulder with you. Then you cannot put the blame on me. You have to put the blame on those who are hypocrites, <coughs> who just condemn one side. This is the wrong place. I'm here to talk about teenagers getting killed. But you taking my attention to talk about like France government, there are so many media. And I condemn that. I was loud enough to say that women should make decision over their own body. I was loud enough to condemn Burkini ban in European Parliament. This is, not, this is my place to talk about my sisters who don't have any choice. When I'm your side, this is wrong, that you're pointing me and saying that I don't have choice. So I'm fighting with you, shoulder to shoulder with you. Then you have to fight shoulder to shoulder with me for the sisters in Iran and Afghanistan who get raped. Inshallah. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. No, he's, he's from Iran. He's from a lot of men in Iran supporting their sister. Come on, come on. Please give the microphone to him. Manam, I love you. Zan Zendegi Azadi. Zan Zendegi Azadi. Woman, life, freedom. Okay, thanks for uh, coming here. Sorry, I needed that. And, I needed this. Uh, thanks for letting me uh, ask course. my question. Um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm very surprised here. I just wanted to add something because of uh, the misinformation here. Uh, that, uh, yeah, it's, as far as I know, it's not a law that like, uh, women cannot uh, ride bicycle. But all of us know, like as an Iranian, all of us know that what happens to them if they do that. Like, I mean, Masa Amini got killed uh, w w with the same reason, right? So uh, if you say that, if you ask this question here, I, I mean, it's kind yeah. of shady. S second, uh, my question is like about These are the men of Iran, <laughs> supporting their sisters. Second, uh, my question is about like the, uh, the coalition, and do you think that uh, is there in, uh, is there going to be any coalition? Like mm -hmm. in two days, you and uh, Reza Pahlavi and like uh, many other uh, people, including uh, Abdullah Murtadi, are going to attend at Georgetown, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that was a good sign to me. But I don't know about like, do you think any coalition is going to happen, or uh, what is like? going on right now. The conversation is going on to have a coalition, a front, a united front, because I believe that this is very important. Uh, for years and years, uh, the Iranian regime tried to divide us many times, saying that we, you know, if you get rid of us, you don't have any opposition. You don't have any leaders. Iran is going to be like Syria, like Libya. But believe me, if you open the doors of prison in Iran, there are so many leaders. They can run the country better than these backward mullahs. But now, 
leaders of democratic countries, they cannot go to the street and talk to these brave leaders inside Iran. So that's why I believe that we, the opposition activists outside Iran, must get united and have a united front, have a coalition to meet with the leaders of G7 and to force them to isolate the Islamic Republic. So I, I'm hopeful, and this is just the beginning, the beginning of the end, the end of the Islamic Republic. You remember, for years and years, I was saying that the compulsory hijab is like the Berlin Wall. If we get successful to bring this wall down, the Islamic Republic won't exist. I still believe in that. And thank you so much for supporting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.